Hello everyone, I'm Maureen O'Boyle. Eric Menendez's best friend tells how they partied away in Mexico after Eric killed his parents. And why Tanya Harding hasn't been kicked out of the Olympics tonight on A Current Affair. First, Eric Menendez killed his wealthy parents. Then, he partied the nights away on a vacation with a friend. He said he wasn't so upset about his death. Find out what Eric revealed weeks before he was arrested for murder. He said that he couldn't stop seeing the room where his parents were, were killed. Secrets of a blood brother. Why hasn't Tanya Harding been kicked off the Olympic team? I think it's probably um, upsetting that this has really overshadowed the whole spirit of the Olympics so far. How this scandal could turn America's pride into America's shame. Witness the most incredible story of human kindness. How an entire community fought a brutal storm to bring a little girl the gift of life. I don't think I'd ever been touched that deep in my life when I saw all the people out there. Special delivery. Thanks for joining us tonight. Their trials cost taxpayers over a million dollars, took up six months of courtroom time, and yet the jury still couldn't make up their minds on the Menendez brothers. But tonight, we have the incredible story of how one of them behaved on a carefree vacation when he thought he'd gotten away with killing his mom and dad. John Johnston retraces the steps of Eric Menendez with the pal who partied with him in Mexico. My dad. The emotionally broken Eric Menendez we came to know during his murder trial is a far cry from the wealthy young man prosecutors say cashed in on his parents' death. Less than 90 days after he and his brother Lyle emptied two shotguns into his mother and father, Eric went on an extravagant vacation to Cancun, Mexico, where money was no object and he wasn't alone. He paid for everything. Dave Marovich, Eric's best friend, went along for the ride. And now, for the first time, talks of the wild days and the wilder nights with his buddy in Cancun. A carefree vacation that became the center of the prosecution's case in what has been called the Blood Brothers murder trial. He was just looking to get away from L.A., I think. Uh, I think he just wanted to have a good time, yeah. Mr. Menendez, you've heard the testimony of your brother that you and he killed your parents on August 20th, 1989. Did you not? Yes, we did. With that kind of confession, the case seems so clear-cut. The prosecution story of two spoiled rich kids who murdered their millionaire parents out of greed. But Dave Marovich can't believe that the motive was money. They always had money. Uh, money... Money never seemed to be an issue for either of them. They already had all the money they needed, you know, to their parents. Dave Marovich and Eric Menendez have been best friends since the eighth grade. They were classmates here at the Princeton Day School in New Jersey. How close were you and Eric when you were going to school here? Uh, we were very good friends. After ninth grade in 1986, Jose Menendez, a multi-millionaire movie executive, moved his family to Beverly Hills. Still, Eric and Dave remain close, with frequent telephone calls and sporadic visits. Then out of nowhere, Dave got a call he'll never forget. It was Eric, telling him his mother and father had been murdered. He told me that uh, now that his parents were, were dead, that uh, the, o the only thing holding them together uh, was the fact that he had money. And he said, uh, without that, uh, you know, he'd be nowhere. That's a strange thing to say. Yeah. What do you think he meant by that? I think he, I think he meant that he was upset to some degree that he didn't have parents anymore. And that uh, without them, he, you know, he was, he was all alone. Just three months after the Menendez murders, Eric called his best friend Dave 
and asked him to meet him here in beautiful Cancun, Mexico. All expenses paid. Eric was having some trouble dealing with his mom and dad's debts. Little did Dave know at the time just how much trouble Eric would eventually be in. Just months after leaving here, Eric was arrested for the murders of his mom and dad. Eric is a good friend of mine, and uh, it's, uh, it's nice being here just so I can remember him being out of jail. Dave Maravich took us back on a personal tour to retrace some of Eric Menendez's last steps as a free man. He and Dave lived it up, staying at this posh hotel, dining in nice restaurants, and parting the night away at clubs. Once again, money was no object, even though it was his dead parents' money. He was in a good mood. He was kind of relaxed. We were just out to have, you know, a good time. Although the vacation was an escape for Eric Menendez, a strange part of it brought him tumbling back to reality. An eerie trip to the Mayan ruins, two and a half hours away. Buried in the wall of skulls was a haunting reminder of what he left behind back home. He said, look at all these skulls. He felt like he couldn't avoid the image of, of his parents' death. I think that Eric was trying to explain to me his parents' death in a way that I can understand, but without him telling me that he did it himself. He said that uh, he couldn't stop seeing the room where his parents were, were killed. What did he tell you about the murders at the time? He said that he found them in the, in the den and that they were just uh, blown to pieces. Despite that chilling revelation, Eric never did tell Dave that he and Lyle killed their own parents. I have no idea. Uh, that thought never even crossed your mind? Never. Yeah. I couldn't imagine, you know, I couldn't imagine he would do it. Did he seem to be emotional at the time? He was upset about his mother. And at one odd time, he said, you know, he said, uh, he said he wasn't so upset about his dad. He said, you know, I'm not that upset about my dad. Even during his early years in school, Dave remembers Eric's hatred for his father. Eric was the ace on the tennis team. Still, it just wasn't good enough for Jose Menendez. I just really yelled at him once uh, at a tennis court for, for winning a match. He won a match, a pretty big match here, here in Mercer County. And his father just went berserk after in front of uh, a couple hundred people who were watching, saying, you know, he played terribly and, you know, and Eric had won. And Eric had won. And he said, you know, he told Eric that, that, that uh, he, didn't, he didn't deserve to win. And, you know, he just played horribly. How did Eric react? And Eric was just terribly embarrassed. My dad had been molesting me. But even with the revelations of abuse during the trial, Dave still can't believe Eric and Lyle killed their parents in cold blood. He often thinks about his last days with his best buddy, searching for answers. The only thing that doesn't make sense to me is the fact that he did it. I still find it hard to believe that Eric actually, that Eric actually killed him. That's the only thing that, that really doesn't uh, make sense. Just because it's so out of character for him. Well, we'll have to wait and see what two new juries believe about the Menendez brothers. Next month, a hearing will decide when the two new trials will begin for them. In a moment, the question on everyone's lips, why is Tanya Harding still on the Olympic team? Next, we'll look for answers. You train so hard for something, you don't want to let that go. And later, an entire community comes to the aid of a sick little girl, a rescue mission you don't want to miss. most popular topic of polls around the country. Should Tanya Harding be allowed to compete in the Winter Olympics? Well, it's a tough decision that now rests on the shoulders of the Olympic Committee. Tonight, Steve Dunleavy looks at the Olympic Code of Conduct that many believe has already been broken by Tanya Harding. Perhaps no Olympic athlete has fallen so dramatically from grace as Tanya Harding. 
I would like to begin by saying how sorry I am about what happened to Nancy Kerrigan. I am embarrassed and ashamed. But the question remains, should she or shouldn't she, will she or won't she go to the Olympic Games? As far as her skating ability, she earned a spot on the team. But figure skater Scott Hamilton, the 1988 Olympic gold medalist, raises the question that now has become deafening. Whether or not um, she re represents the Olympic ideal with everything that's happened and her not coming forward with the information when she got it, um, that's something that's left up to the Olympic Committee and United States Figure Skating Association. It has nothing to do with U.S. law because to be an Olympian is a privileged position. And that privileged position, according to silver medalist Paul Wiley, will ultimately be judged by this man, William Heibel, and his Olympic Committee. I can tell you that they're going to base their decision on the code of conduct and the code of ethics that is written in the figure skating manual and that the skaters sign off on at the U.S. Nationals and at sponsored competitions. Now this is the code of conduct which was signed by Tonya Harding on January 9th, only three days after skating rival Nancy Kerrigan was viciously kneecapped in Detroit. She's protected under due process under the laws of the United States, but that's a totally different set of uh, issues there. The issue? Well, back to the code of conduct which Tonya signed herself. Now, it specifically states in paragraph one that all members of the Olympic team shall conduct themselves in conformity with Olympic traditions and bear themselves in a manner that will bring honor and credit to themselves, their teammates, and to the United States of America. I had no prior knowledge of the planned assault on Nancy Kerrigan. I am responsible, however, for failing, re for failing to report things I learned about the assault when I returned home from nationals. It's a trouble spot for her that she didn't go with, didn't go to the proper authorities with the information she knew uh, right after it happened. It's a terrible thing to happen to her while she's, you know, going into the most important two months of her life. So uh, you can't imagine that anyone would would be involved in something like this. Although my lawyers tell me that my failure to immediately report this information is not a crime. I know I have let you down, but I have also let myself down. If in fact she did know about the crime, which she admitted to after the fact, there is something called an accessory after the fact, which gives her the obligation to go to the law and explain to them what in fact had happened. And she clearly didn't do that, at least not initially. Linda Shubb is an attorney and a professional figure skater. If perhaps she knew about what she was saying, she was under oath, and by speaking to a federal officer, you're for all intents and purposes under oath, and then she recanted her statement, that could be perjury. I have done nothing to violate the standards and excellence of, sport, of sportsmanship that are expected in an Olympic athlete. I think morally, she shouldn't go. I mean, and I think that's the feeling of everybody. It, it is a sport that is supposed to hold some high self-esteem. And that's lost regardless with Tanya. But the final decision rests with this man, William Heibel, who chairs the committee investigating Tanya Harding. This is not a criminal matter. This is an administrative matter for the United States Figure Skating Association. And tomorrow, Jeff Galuli gives his side of the story in an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with a current affair. When we come back, hundreds of strangers battle the worst snowstorm in years to save a three-year-old's life. She became a part of all of this. Country star Tammy Wynette comes back from the brink of death, an exclusive interview with an American legend. As the legendary Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue hits the newsstands, we've got the behind-the-scenes stuff that is so hot, the magazine won't dare show you. And you'll only see it on the next Entertainment Night. Tonight at 7 on KYW3. Exclusive, the Kerrigan Conspiracy. From the setup to the final blow, the hitmen revealed their plot. Plus, Bert and Lonnie, an exclusive look into what went wrong on Hard Copy. Tonight at 7.30 on KYW3. Here's some
something to make you feel good. A wonderful story about the human spirit and the kindness of strangers. Robin Dorian reports on the town that opened its heart of gold for a little girl fighting for life. Maureen, for everyone who thinks the heart of society is stuck in permanent cardiac arrest, I am happy to report that is not the case in Louisville, Kentucky. In a battle against time and mother nature, strangers banded together in what was considered the worst snowstorm in the city's history, all in an effort to save the life of a three-year-old child. The interstates are terrible. That is our heaviest single snowfall ever. And there is a sense of panic out there. It was the snowstorm that paralyzed Louisville, 16 inches by midday. The airport was closed, the roads were covered, and people were told not to go outside. If you don't have a four-wheel drive vehicle, just stay at home. I could not believe what I was seeing. It was like a blizzard. You couldn't see across the street. But this was not a day Barbara Schmidt could remain indoors. This was the day her three-year-old granddaughter would be forced to enter a race against the clock, a race against the elements, a race she was sure they would lose. It was the most traumatic thing I've ever gone through. At 10.30 in the morning, Barbara received the call she had been waiting for for two years. She said, I've got some good news for you. She said, we've got the baby's liver. And I just went all to pieces. Michelle was finally going to be able to get her long-awaited liver transplant. But she had to get to Omaha, Nebraska, and she had to get there by 7 p.m. We're not used to this type of snow in Louisville. They don't know how to handle that kind of snow. And our first impression was, we're not going to get out. She's not going to get the liver now. It just uh, broke my heart. Hairdresser Sharon Stevens had been working with the Schmitz to raise money to pay for Michelle's transplant. And she wasn't going to let anything stop her from completing her mission. She said that uh, we're going to have to let the liver go so another child can have it because we can't get out. And I said, start packing. Uh, don't stop unless you hear from me. I'm going to get you out of here. So Sharon decided to broadcast her plea for help. This is Beth Merrill, News Radio 84, WHAS. Sharon Stevens called WHAS Radio with a plea for help to get the little girl out of Louisville to Omaha. By the time I got back to the newsroom, the phones were ringing off the hook. I was listening to the radio. W Teresa Amshoff learned that the Schmitz were able to get a helicopter, but that there was no place for it to land. Well, I called in and I spoke to a woman named Kelly. I can't remember her last name. And I told her I lived right here behind the church and that it was free of wires and no trees, and surely they could land a helicopter back there. And she asked me if it was shoveled, and I said no. And I said, well, that won't be no problem. I could get a whole street load of people to help shovel. And though the city seemed to be frozen in place, people appeared almost like magic. Hundreds of strangers whose hearts were warmed by Michelle's predicament. It makes me feel good, really does. I, I enjoy doing it. I don't think I've ever been touched that deep in my life when I saw all the people out there. Michelle's father, Ed Schmidt, knows the meaning of heartbreak. His wife died in August of 1992. And his only other daughter, five-year-old Ashley, also had to have a liver transplant back in 1991. I'm a very fortunate person. Um, uh, I, I'm fortunate in the fact that I've, I've still got my two kids. By late afternoon, Michelle and her family were airborne. A donated corporate jet flew her to Omaha, and she was on the operating table by 9 p.m. I want everybody, you know, to be able to see Michelle and be able to see what their efforts, you know, did. If it were to happen again tomorrow, I believe that when people's hearts are into things, uh, they will, it would happen again. She became a part of all of us. She was part of the community. She was a miracle that happened in the middle of the snowstorm. At this point, Michelle's doing quite well, but she must remain in Omaha for a few more weeks so that doctors can monitor her condition. Of course, we all wish her well. Maureen? Thanks, Robin. It's nice to see some good news. If you'd like to help the Schmidt family with their enormous medical bills, you can send a donation to Hair Angels Incorporated, 239 Chenoweth Lane, Suite 3, Louisville, Kentucky, 40207.
And A Current Affair will be back in a moment with the music video that lets you be at home with the Buttafucos. Now a current affair goes face to face with Jeff Galuli. I feel bad for her. Do you still love Tanya? Of course I do. Uh, yeah, I still love Tanya. She knows how I feel about her. Jeff Galuli speaks one on one only to a current affair. Now, for the first time, find out about the real Tanya Harding, the man who knows her better than anyone, talks about America's most scandalous ice skater. Exclusive, Jeff Galuli speaks. We'll have that interview with Jeff Galuli for you tomorrow. Plus, country legend Tammy Wynette talks for the first time about her miraculous recovery. We leave you tonight with the music video that hit stores today. You saw it first on A Current Affair, and it just won't go away. Here's Joey. I'm Maureen O'Boyle. Have a good evening. How does it feel to be hanging out with a bunch of rock and roll stars? Oh, beats hanging around with that dull guy, Joe Botafuco. Sources say it's now just a matter of time. Before Tanya Harding is arrested, there are new clues tonight, and we'll hear from the admitted hitman. That's all coming up right here on KYW3's News Tonight.